So in part one of this series, I'm going to unpack the Kalam so we can get our definition straight. This is because in philosophy it's perfectly normal for someone to define even common terms or phrases in a very specific way and so long as they're consistent in using them that way in the argument everything's fine. The problem is is that if you're new to philosophy and you're just hearing the argument for the first time it can not only be confusing it makes the argument seem a lot stronger than it actually is. So I'm going to start by giving you the Kalam argument itself. Premise 1 everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2 the universe began to exist. Conclusion therefore the universe has a cause. Sounds pretty simple right? Well not really. First we're gonna unpack the argument and in case anybody thinks I'm misrepresenting definitions by William Lane Craig I'm gonna provide links in the description section to back all this up. The first phrase we got to define is begins to exist. I like to call this Craig's get out of jail free card for God. This is because Craig defines this very simple phrase in a very kind of complex way. I'm going to quote Craig here. Begins to exist means for any entity E and time T, E comes into being at T if and only if 1. E exists at T. 2. T is the first time at which E exists. 3. There is no state of affairs in the actual world in which E exists timelessly. And 4. E's existing at T is a tensed fact. Now, if you look at this definition, it seems pretty odd. Parts 1 and 2 appear sufficient to describe what most people would assume begins to exist actually means. But such a definition, if you left it alone, would mean even God could begin to exist. And that's unacceptable. So we've got to tack on part three to give God an out. So this actually asserts that something could exist timelessly, but it's not really clear what could exist in such a way. So some philosophers argue things like numbers and the laws of logic are timeless, but this is a, re a view called Platonism. Um, it means that like the number four exists in some realm somewhere that we can't touch it, but we can interact with it. It's like a thing, but you know, I'm not going to even get into that. We're just going to say for the sake of argument, they can have three. It's how they're smuggling God into the argument, but they can have it. So even with that, we're still left with this really odd piece in number four. What is a tenseless a tensed fact have to do with beginning to exist? Well, it really doesn't. All this means is that Craig is getting you to agree to a philosophical position known as the A theory or the tense theory of time when you say you agree with premise one. Now, this is a very controversial philosophical position with a good amount of scientific evidence against it, but we're going to get to that later. What you got to learn from this is that something like a simple phrase like begins to exist has a very specific meaning with a lot behind it in an argument like this. The next word we have to define properly is the word universe. So when Craig or other theologians use the word universe, they take it to mean the whole of material reality, which basically includes all matter and energy. Well, all matter is already energy, but that's a technicality. So when the Kalam says that the universe began to exist, this means that aside from the God they're trying to prove, absolutely nothing existed. They want no matter, no energy, not even time itself. This is because apologists are trying to argue to a theological conclusion that's in their Bible that says that God created the universe ex nihilo, which basically means out of nothing. They like their fancy words. Now, in contrast to this definition, Science uses the word universe a bit differently, especially in modern cosmology. So when you hear the universe talked about by like Alexander Vilenkin, they're really talking about what's known as a space-time universe, which is defined as a four-dimensional manifold. Now, to try and understand this, and I know it's complex, you kind of have to think about the three dimensions that we're all familiar with, length, width, height, and then you got to tack on a fourth dimension, which is really time itself. And this kind of makes like a four-dimensional coordinate system, if you can think about it. Um, and that's what they mean when they say 
that's what our universe is. Now, the distinction is, is that this space-time universe is made up of out of energy, like everything else that we know of. But when they say that the universe began to exist, they're not saying that all that energy and matter just came out of being from nothing. That's what the apologists mean. So it's a very critical difference when you listen to a scientist talk about the beginning of the universe versus a theologian. All right, the next word we have to define properly is the word nothing. I know, I know, it's not in the argument itself, but, you know, Craig likes to defend the argument by saying something can't come from nothing. And nothing to a philosopher like Craig is very different from the nothing to a scientist like Lawrence Krauss. So a philosopher is going to define nothing as the absence of anything. And to be fair, this is a very common definition for the word, and it's what most people are going to kind of think about when you say nothing. So where's the problem? The problem is, is that when you try to marry this definition to reality, we don't find that anywhere. The closest thing we come to nothing is what scientists call the quantum vacuum. And this is like if you go out into space and you have the vacuum, the void out there, and you look at it, well, there's actually this quantum vacuum inside of it. And in this quantum vacuum is a sea of quantum energy that's fluctuating constantly. So that's the closest we can come to actually nothing. And you'll see Craig and other apologists point this out when, you know, uh, scientists try to object to his premise one by saying that these quantum virtual particles come into existence out of nothing um, and they appear uncaused. Craig's going to object and say, well, no, that's not nothing. There's something there. And he's right. So you'd think, OK, we've kind of got this argument between definitions and which one do we use? Well, we really can't pick which one to go with. It's not definitive one way or the other. But I'm going to have to give the advantage to the scientists because, like I said, the philosophers have defined nothing in such a way that we don't even know if it could exist. At least there's no debate whether or not quantum mechanics exists. That's another distinction that we have to be aware of going into this whole argument. All right. The last word we need to define properly is cause, specifically how it's used in premise one. This is a little bit complicated because the word is being used in a way that masks the absurdity of the position that the Kalam is arguing for. Now, if you push on Dr. Craig, he'll first say when he says cause, he means that which produces an effect, or something like that. But then he necessarily has to break up causation in order to get to the theological conclusion that his Bible demands. Basically, philosophers break up causation into different types. Luckily for the argument that we're going to go over, we only have to talk about efficient causes and material causes. So what's the difference? Well, the best example I could give you is, say, the Statue of David. The efficient cause is the cause that's the action that has something come to be. So the Statue of David, that would be the artist Michelangelo. Um, now, the material cause is the stuff out of which something is made. So, Statue of David's made out of marble. So, the material cause would be the slab of marble that Michelangelo carved it out of. So, the important thing that you have to realize when you listen to the Kalam cosmological argument is that they're very specifically arguing for a efficient cause but not a material cause. That's getting back to this whole creation out of nothing business that they're trying to argue for. And that's the last distinction that I want you to be aware of as we continue the discussion. And that's going to be it for part one. I really hate having to do this much time on definitions, but I hope you can see why I thought it was necessary. So just so you know what's coming up, I intend for three more parts in this series. The next part is going to go over what I consider to be the two biggest philosophical problems with the Kalam cosmological argument. After that, we're going to get into the science, and that's where it's going to get really fun. Specifically, part three is going to refute the evidence that Craig brings up that try and supports the Kalam, and I'm going to show it really doesn't do that. And the final part's my favorite. That's where we're going to go into some scientific background that shows how the Kalam is really a circular argument when you come right down to it. So... In case you haven't noticed, I'm really new to doing things on YouTube, so I'd really appreciate any comments or feedback you've got for me. 
I've also created a blog that I want to go along with this channel in case you want to see the issue gone into in a bit more detail. Finally, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching. The first sign that there's trouble is right there in the name, the Kalam Cosmological Argument. This is just one more spin on the flawed classical cosmological argument. All cosmological arguments basically try to apply causality to the origin of the universe to try and prove God's existence. The thing is, when you take cause and effect and go back to the origin of everything, you're left with two options, an infinite regress of causes and effects, or with something that had to have always existed, something that has a necessary existence, in which the theist mind just has to be their particular God. The classical defeater for this is to ask, why can't the universe itself be necessary, or always have existed? The Kalam is just yet another variant of the argument that tries to give God a get-out-of-jail-free card by introducing the notion of timeless existence, and then trying to tie all of material reality to the existence of time. Then it just sprinkles on a little bit of modern cosmology to make it seem like the argument has significant scientific support, when it really doesn't. Now, there are a lot of philosophical objections that could be brought against the Kalam, but I want to focus on the two that I think are the most straightforward. If you remember back to my definitions video and the distinction between efficient and material causes that happens in this argument, then the first objection I have is to say that we can't have an effect that has no material cause. This is a strong objection because the only justification Dr. Craig has for his premise one of the Kalam is intuition and common experience. If you try to challenge Dr. Craig on his premise one, he'll largely just call you disingenuous and state that you can't be doing any serious metaphysics without it. YouTuber Sisyphus Redeemed has a great video exposing why trying to get premise one of the Kalam accepted as a universal truth using only intuition and personal experience as justification is a fallacy all on its own, and I recommend checking his video out. There's going to be a link to it in the description box. The problem for Dr. Craig is that even if we grant this universal principle of causality, he's going to have another set of problems, because we could just as easily use the same justification that he does to establish a premise that everything material that exists has a material cause, from which it flows logically that something material must have always existed. And that's theologically objectionable to Dr. Craig and other Christians who want a creation out of nothing. Now this objection has been brought up before, but Dr. Craig likes to mischaracterize it a bit whenever he tries to rebut it. However, I'm linking a video in the description box where Dr. Craig admits that this is a problem for the Kalam, and specifically how he's going to get around it. What's important here is that what Dr. Craig thinks is required to overcome the notion that everything material requires a material cause is that if he has good arguments and evidence that show that everything material has an absolute beginning, and was preceded by nothing, then he can get rid of the notion of everything material requiring a material cause. Notice here, though, that Craig has to accept the premise of uh, material causation being necessary. He actually has the burden of proof to show that this is definitely not the case. And it's actually a really big burden, because by his own standards, he has to show that it's not only possible that material causation isn't universally applicable, but that it absolutely is the case that it's not universally applicable. So he has to show that all material reality had an absolute beginning, and that it was preceded by nothing, in order to rule out that possibility. So, where do we get this standard from? Well, Craig's going to give it to us. We can see it in how he responds to objections on his premise involving efficient causation. In quantum mechanics, some events are indeterminate, and it looks like they lack an efficient cause based on which interpretation of quantum mechanics you're going to hold to. So, what used to be the most popular view was called the Copenhagen interpretation, and it was indeterminate. Craig very quickly objects here and says that, hey, there are other deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics, which means it hasn't been shown decisively that efficient causation as a universal principle has been violated. And you know what? He's right. The most current popular view among scientists is what's known as the many worlds interpretation, which is deterministic. Although, ironically, it entails actual affinities, but we'll get into why that's ironic later. But notice here, it's not really about which interpretation is correct, we don't actually know. It could very well be the case that Craig is wrong, and the Copenhagen interpretation is correct. 
But since we don't know, he feels justified in holding that the efficient causation principle is true until he's conclusively shown otherwise. That's how much strength he gives to the idea of justification based on intuition and common experience. So when Craig wants to turn around and reject material causation based on the same thing, he's got a pretty high bar he set for himself to get over. All right, so let's look at the bar. He's got to prove that all material reality has absolutely got a beginning and that it was preceded by nothing. Now, my job is going to show that he can't prove either of these two things, especially not decisively, and that when it comes down to it, there's actually evidence against such a thing being the case. There's one other thing I want to add here. At times, Craig will concede that virtual particles don't have an efficient cause, but he still claims that Kalam's premise 1 is still valid because they have a material cause. Here, Craig reverts back to the general definition of cause to try and save his premise, but in doing so, he undercuts his argument. If we have things that begin to exist with only material and not an efficient cause, then that leaves the creation of our space-time universe as something created by exactly that process. In this scenario, a god isn't necessary to cause the universe, only some form of pre-existing material that has always existed. And then we're right back to Craig having to show that material reality must have had an absolute beginning, preceded by nothing. Now, this segues really nicely into my second major philosophical problem with the Kalam. This is Craig's major argument against some form of material reality always existing, the argument against the infinity of the past. Now. Craig starts off his argument with an assertion that an actual infinity can't exist in the real world. His actual syllogism isn't really important. It all kind of comes down to this crucial premise and how he justifies it. And he likes to prove this by going through some thought experiments like Hilbert's Hotel. And through this, he shows that if an actual infinity existed in the real world, it leads to absurdities. And this is largely because he's going to subtract different values from infinity, sometimes using infinite subsets of infinite numbers, and he's going to come up with the same or contradictory answers. Now, I kind of have to admit, Craig's rhetoric here can be kind of convincing, up until the point you realize that he's treating infinity as if it were like the number four, which is something you simply can't do. The problem for Craig is that all of the absurdities that he can pull out of different thought experiments are perfectly logically consistent with each other. It's just kind of counterintuitive because the math dealing with infinite sets is kind of complicated and it's got its own set of special rules. But the math that does deal with infinite sets is a very well-defined subject. It's called Cantorian set theory. This is very important because it actually serves as the foundation for most of modern mathematics. Now, Craig is smart enough to avoid trying to disprove something as well established as Cantorian set theory, and he actually will come out and admit that there's no logical contradiction involved in his examples. But then he makes this really odd move in saying that while Cantorian set theory is consistent, it kind of only works on paper, or is the concept in your mind, and that infinity still couldn't exist in the real world. There's this great paper by a guy named Josh Denver that I'm going to link to in the description box that shows just how outrageous it is to claim that there's a branch of well-defined mathematics that's valid but doesn't apply to reality. Um, but that's not exactly what we need to take away from this. It's just an interesting side point. What we need to take away from this is that there's no logical contradictions to any actual infinites existing in the real world. All Craig is left doing is claiming that they're metaphysically absurd, which is largely a designation that's up to an individual philosopher. One philosopher calls something absurd, and another one says, eh, it's just an oddity. Still, even if Craig was right, and actual infinities are absurd means it can't exist in the real world, well, what if we amended it to be something like, if an actual infinity exists in the real world, then it would exist in such a way that it would be physically impossible to subtract from it. This would get rid of almost all of the absurdities that Craig brings up. So what if space and time were actual infinites in this way? I mean, we can't take time away. We can't take space away from itself. In fact, they're always expanding in our universe. We know this. So it's at least plausible, right? Well, what's Craig going to do? He's going to object, and he's going to say, it's never been proven that space and time are a continuum. And he's right. But it's also never been proven that space and time are quantized either. We just don't know. 
it's entirely plausible that they're a continuum, and there's actually some evidence that suggests that's the case, and we're going to get into that later in the science section. But for now, we just want to show that it's not impossible. It's not even implausible that it's that the past could be infinite. But the real problem I have with Craig isn't just how he tries to make an infinite past look bad. It's what he does next. Let's say, for the sake of argument, we grant Craig's claim that an actual infinite is impossible in reality. What do we get left with as his cause of the universe? This is especially problematic since Craig wants to say that time starts with the creation of the universe. Then we've got this logical problem that there shan't be something before the beginning of time. Craig's answer here is that we have a god that is timeless sans creation, and it enters into time with the creation of the universe. To get around the logical impossibility of this god existing before the beginning of time, Craig claims that God's act of creation is absolutely simultaneous with the creation of the universe. Alright, there are two huge problems here, but I'm going to focus on just one for now. Remember back to our definitions. Timelessness literally means changelessness. The immediate question that comes up is, how can timeless causation even work? Now, Craig's going to answer here and say that God timelessly willed to create the universe. But I don't understand how you could will something and also be timeless. But even if we grant that's possible, how can something that's by definition changeless affect a change? Craig's only answer to this is to say that it's mysterious but not incoherent. That's it. He just goes, hey, you know what? It's mysterious, but it's at least not a squared circle. You could say the same thing about an actual infinity. Hey, look, it's mysterious, but it ain't a square circle. You know, we could even go a step further and maybe claim that timeless causation is metaphysically absurd. So at best, the Kalam relies on rejecting one supposed absurdity for another, and we're left not knowing which one is the right course to take. The key here is that no matter which way you go when it comes to the creation of the freaking universe, you're going to be left dealing with something that's counterintuitive. And like with so many things in apologetics, it may seem like two equal choices, but it's not. When it comes to actual infinities, we can at least begin to understand the concept and work with it, and it actually serves as a foundation for more concrete things like basic arithmetic. We don't have any examples of anything definitely existing that's timeless, let alone something that's timeless that can also affect a change. The worst part is that this is supposed to be the good argument that we use to reject material causation as some universal principle that goes along with Craig's efficient causation principle. Now sure, I can't prove Craig is absolutely wrong to go with a timeless causation over an infinite past, but I don't have to. Remember, he's the one making the claim, both about material causation not being universal and about this whole God thing in the first place. All I've got to do is show that he doesn't really make any conclusive case and that one can't even be made. Even if Craig wants to turn around and try to make an inference to the best explanation, the evidence is way more on the side of actual infinities instead of timeless causation. And that's going to wrap up my philosophical objections to the Kalam. Now, in the next video, I'm going to directly address how there's absolutely no good scientific evidence that show that all of material reality has an absolute beginning preceded by nothing. Thanks for watching. In this part, I'm going to start refuting any supposed scientific evidence that's presented along with the Kalam cosmological argument. But before I start doing that, there's something very important I want to get up front about the basic facts of modern cosmology that just need to be stated. The most honest answer about the origin of the universe is quite simply, we do not yet know. This is very quickly followed up with, it is quite possible that we may never know. This very basic fact is actually acknowledged by apologist William Lane Craig in his book, Creation Out of Nothing, on page 246. And I quote, it is true that an accurate physical description of the universe prior to the Planck time remains unknown and perhaps always will remain unknown, thereby affording room for speculations aimed at averting the origin of time and space implied in the expanding universe. So what does this mean? This means everything that goes on 
both science and theology-wise, that talks about the beginning of the universe is speculative. Science, at least, is kind of chipping away at the possibilities. It's finding things that we can say definitely didn't happen. Ultimately, this is why the Kalam and any other cosmological argument is an argument from ignorance. An argument from ignorance is basically, I don't know, therefore God. The Kalam just dresses this fundamental problem up a bit, and it just leaves the core issue there and tries to hide it as best it can. All right. All that out of the way, let's get into the science. All right, here's the first piece of science that Dr. Craig's going to try and use to support his premise that the universe began to exist. It's known as the Big Bang Singularity Theorem. And the first thing you got to realize here is that a singularity is different from the regular old Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory actually says nothing about how the universe came into existence and only describes how our space-time universe expanded and evolved after what's known as the first Planck second. Just in case you were wondering, a Planck second is a second times 10 to the negative 43rd power. Anyway, the Big Bang Singularity is an attempt to explain what happened before that first Planck second. And it's done assuming that general relativity still holds at the scales involved at that point. What we get is a mathematical and physical singularity where many physical properties pretty much quickly break down into infinity. This includes infinite temperature, density, and curvature. So now that we've defined the singularity theory, how do we show that it doesn't support the clock? Well, the first thing you got to know is that the singularity is largely disregarded by modern cosmologists. This is because that critical assumption that's made, that general relativity holds before the first Planck second, is known to be unsound. Once you get to that point in the Big Bang, at that small scale, quantum mechanical effects become extremely important and general relativity breaks down. In fact, singularities are generally a sign that there's a missing piece to a scientific theory We've already got examples of this before in physics. Now, as it turns out, cosmologists already know that there's a missing piece to general relativity. Specifically, we don't have an understanding of quantum gravity yet, and that's required to marry quantum mechanics to general relativity. This is the biggest problem that faces modern physics today. That all said, our best attempts to account for quantum mechanical effects point to the idea that there was no actual singularity at the beginning of our space-time universe. So, if all that's not enough to convince you that the Big Bang singularity isn't even a valid theory, let alone evidence for the, to support the Kalam cosmological argument, there's another point that needs to be made. Even if the singularity theory were held as valid, it doesn't imply that all matter and energy simply came into existence by divine fiat. Remember the philosophy section. Dr. Craig has got to show that all of physical reality had an absolute beginning and was preceded by nothing. What says the universe didn't exist perpetually in this state of infinite density, temperature, and curvature before it started expanding via natural processes? So, in order to correct this theologically untenable situation, some sleight of hand is going to be required. Now, if you remember back to the philosophy section, you're going to know that Dr. Craig really doesn't like the idea of actual infinites. So, normally, you'd assume that a person with a strong commitment against the existence of anything that's a completed infinite would mean such a person would reject the Big Bang Singularity Theory with all of its infinite properties. Never one to disappoint, Dr. Craig directly tries to argue that the singularity being infinite actually means it's equivalent to literally nothing. Quote Dr. Craig, This event that marked the beginning of the universe becomes all the more amazing when one reflects on the fact that the state of infinite density is synonymous to nothing. There can be no object that possesses infinite density, for if it had any size at all, it could still be more dense. So, rather than agree with the scientists who show that general relativity doesn't hold at these extremely small scales and reject the Bing Bang Singularity Theorem, apologists must now defy any notion of mathematics and state that infinity equals zero. This is just plain bad philosophy, as pointed out by philosopher Wes Morrison. I quote, 
no one would suppose that it follows from the fact that there could be no round squares that round square is synonymous with nothing but neither should anyone suppose it follows from the fact assuming that it is a fact that there could be no infinitely dense objects that infinite density is synonymous with nothing still the problem seems to get worse the more you think about it because if on some reflection it almost seems like the apologists have to deny the transitive property of equality you know that if a equals b b then b equals a because if an apologist holds that no actual infinite can exist and also states that something with infinite density is synonymous with nothing then they cannot claim that we had creation out of nothing this is because if there was actually a state of nothing then by the apologist's own definition that's the same thing as an actual infinite existing. The whole thing is just silly on its face. So now that I've shown that the singularity theory doesn't support the fact that our universe had an absolute beginning preceded by nothing, let's look at the second piece of evidence that Dr. Craig cites to support premise two of the Kalam. This is a paper written in 2003 by scientists Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin. Basically, what the theory says is that any space-time universe that is expanding cannot always have been expanding. And one of the things that we know is that our universe is expanding, kind of like an inflating balloon. So, this is actually a pretty important piece of information because one of the scientific assumptions for the 20th century was that our universe kind of always existed in whatever fashion that it does now. So... What also makes this theory so very powerful is that it only requires a very basic assumption that the space-time in question is expanding. That's it. This means it applies to a wide variety of cosmological models. Most importantly, any cosmological model that you're going to apply to our actual universe. So we know it's a very important theory, and it's a very powerful theory. But what we also need to know is that it doesn't support the Kalam cosmological argument. The most important thing that you have to realize from the board guth lenkin theorem is that all that it states about a universe that's in inflation is that that space-time universe cannot have been expanding infinitely into the past. That's it. This isn't a little of the theory, because it's pretty extraordinary and has had fairly significant impacts on modern cosmology. The problem is, apologists like William Lane Craig try to make way too many metaphysical leaps off of this theory when it offers no justification for doing anything like that. It certainly doesn't provide evidence that our physical universe began to exist and was preceded by nothing. What makes the theory so appealing to apologists is that if you try to object based just on the expansion part, they could bog you down in all sorts of science about how if you try to propose an oscillating model for the universe where it contracts before it expands, or if you go into some kind of like an egg thing where it stays in a state and then eventually expands, they could get into all sorts of different confusing cosmology where we can show that's probably not the case, and they kind of pretend to win by default that, hey, the universe had an absolute beginning. This is invalid. The first sign of that is that the three scientists who came up with the theory don't believe in a creator god like William Lane Craig does. This doesn't mean that Craig's wrong, it just means we should be skeptical when he tries to use this theory as evidence that he's right. So where do we go from here? The thing is, is that even if we know that the universe couldn't have always have been expanding, and we have some evidence against an oscillating model or like an egg model for the universe, it doesn't justify saying that the universe was preceded by nothing, and that all of material reality had an absolute beginning by divine fiat. Now, there is a theory that the three scientists from this paper do endorse, and it's similar to what scientists like Lawrence Krauss espouse, which is a theory of quantum nucleation. Effectively, what quantum nucleation means is this. Our four-dimensional space-time didn't always exist. However, the energy that makes it up always has existed, specifically at the quantum level. And it can be shown mathematically that our space-time universe possibly evolved out of a quantum nucleation event that occurred in this energy 13.7 billion years ago. Now there's a whole bunch of other pieces of evidence that actually support the theory, and rather than get into them here, I'm going to link a video by Lawrence Krauss where he gives a lecture on his book, A Universe from Nothing, that 
describes the evidence. It's actually highly informative, and I very much recommend it. But to get back to the whole Kalam argument, what we need to look at here is that we have a scientific theory about the creation of the universe, and it's not just the quantum nucleation theory. There are other ones, but they pretty much all assume that some form of energy or material reality always existed. Now, this is in contrast to the theistic theory of divine creation out of nothing. And, but you still have to look, even in those theories, they're always assuming that God always existed. So you're coming down to the dichotomy that plagues every cosmological argument. So it looks like we've got two theories again. One assumes God always exists. The other assumes that some form of material reality always existed. How do you pick between the two of them? Well, ultimately, you really don't know. But if you want to compare explanatory power, which is a method that Craig likes to use when he wants to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, you're going to see that the scientific explanation provides both a material and an efficient cause, whereas Craig's theory only provides an efficient cause. Honestly, I'm giving the advantage to the scientists again. Still, even if you don't agree with giving the advantage to the scientific explanation, the Kalam hasn't established that all of material reality had an absolute beginning preceded by nothing. Remember the burden of proof is on Dr. Craig and other apologists saying that there definitely is a god and this being definitely created material reality out of nothing. I've shown that these assertions aren't supported by the Kalam or by the scientific evidence they try to show along with it. The apologists are left postulating unnecessary entities we're not sure actually even exist to try and explain the origin of the universe. Compare this to the scientific explanation, and there's no question whether quantum energy and the laws of quantum mechanics actually exist or not. And we have good evidence showing that it's at least possible for our four-dimensional space-time universe to come out of only that. What I'm going to get into in the next video is what I like to think of as the nail in the coffin for the Kalam, and that's to show how it rests on some really bad science, and that ultimately becomes a circular argument because the only reason you have to believe in that bad science is because you already believe in a god. Welcome to the fourth video in my Countering the Kalam series. In this final video, I'm going to show how the Kalam is a circular argument and relies on a discredited and unfalsifiable scientific theory. Now, if you can remember back to my previous videos in the series, then you know that the Kalam cosmological argument relies on the notion of absolute simultaneity and the tensed or A theory of time both being true in order for the argument to even get off the ground. This is because in order to avoid acting before the beginning of time, God's act of creation must be absolutely simultaneous with the creation of all space and time. As for the A theory, this is admitted by Dr. Craig to quote, from start to finish, the Kalam cosmological argument is predicated upon the A theory of time. On a B theory of time, the universe does not in fact come into being or become actual at the Big Bang. It just exists tenselessly as a four-dimensional space-time block that is finitely extended in the earlier-than direction. If time is tenseless, then the universe never really comes into being and, therefore, the quest for a cause of its coming into being is misconceived. The problem here is that Einstein's special relativity provides very strong evidence that the simultaneity of events is always relative, and that absolute simultaneity is impossible. It actually also shows that time is tenseless since there is no privileged reference frame that would make time absolute. This is something that Einstein himself realized in his book Relativity. To quote, since there exists in this four-dimensional structure, space-time, no longer any sections which represent now objectively. The concepts of happening and becoming are indeed not completely suspended, but yet complicated. It appears therefore more natural to think of physical reality as a four-dimensional existence instead of, as hitherto, the evolution of a three-dimensional existence. Now, since special relativity underpins almost all of modern physics, this is a pretty fatal problem for the Kalam. And to get around it, Dr. Craig endorses what's known as the Neo-Lorentzian view of space and time, and that espouses the existence of a privileged reference frame, or what scientists before Einstein called the luminiferous ether. Now, the scientist Hendrik Lorentz was a contemporary of Einstein and was committed to the idea of the motionless ether. He rejected the idea of space-time as a manifold, and the idea that the ether did not exist. 
The problem for him was that special relativity works, and it actually has a wealth of evidence to back it up. So Lorentz went back and reworked his theory, eventually getting it to be mathematically equivalent to the equations for Einstein's special relativity. But in order to do this, he had to leave the ether as a metaphysical idea that was undetectable in principle. This means that not only is there no evidence for the existence of a privileged reference frame, we can never have evidence for it, leaving the theory unfalsifiable and hence unscientific. The problem is that explaining exactly why the neo lorentzian view is so absurd involves some fairly technical material in physics. I'm going to try and simplify the issues to make it more understandable, but I'm going to link to more information on each area so that any viewer can examine the science to verify for themselves that what I'm saying is correct. You can also check my blog for more detailed explanation on all of these points. To get started, you have to understand the uncontroversial relativity principle. This is actually something that you experience every day and probably don't even realize it. Imagine there are two people in a transparent train car, and the train is moving at 100 miles an hour. Person A and Person B decide to race from the back of the car to the front, so they're running in the same direction that the train is moving. Let's say Person B is a little bit faster than Person A. Person A can run at 5 miles an hour, and Person B can run at 7 miles an hour. From Person A's point of view, or frame of reference, Person B is moving faster than them, but not by much only two miles an hour. However, imagine if person C was standing on the side of the tracks and watches this race as the train goes by. From that frame of reference, it will look like both people in the train are going really fast at 105 and 107 miles an hour. However, notice the difference in speed between person A and person B is still only two miles an hour, even though they both look like they're going so much faster to person C compared to each other. This is relativity. How fast each person looks like they're moving is relative to how fast the observer is moving. Each observer has its own frame of reference in this way. However, we know by experiment that the laws of physics, including the laws of motion, don't really change if you're going at different speeds. Force still equals mass times acceleration no matter how fast you're going. This is known as invariance. Since things can look different depending on an observer's reference frame, we use certain types of equations to transform a description of one physical system from one reference frame to another. Before Einstein, in classical Newtonian physics, the transformation used was called a Galilean transformation. So the laws of motion were known as being Galilean invariant. Now if the neo lorentzian interpretation of special relativity is correct, then space and time are absolute and Galilean invariance should be true for physics. What Einstein found in special relativity was that to transition between reference frames, you have to use a Lorentz transformation, meaning that the laws of physics should be Lorentz invariant, not Galilean invariant. When you combine that with the assumption that the speed of light in a vacuum is constant, that's the letter C in the famous equation E equals mc squared, it means that space and time are not absolute and actually deform based on velocity or motion. What we found by experiment was that Einstein was correct. Space and time are actually Lorentz invariant, and they deform the closer you get to the speed of light or when you have a position relative to a large enough mass. Galilean transformations only work if you stay well below the speed of light, and once you start getting close to that speed, it simply doesn't work anymore. This is proven by the phenomenon of time dilation and length contraction. Special relativity predicts both of these deformations of space-time, and we've since been able to verify both of them through a variety of scientific experiments. Basically, if you move really fast, close to the speed of light, the length of an object decreases as space-time warps around it, and basically that's known as length contraction. Similarly, if you move really fast, close to the speed of light, or are situated further away from a large mass, then space-time warps and time actually slows down. That's called time dilation, and we actually use this and account for it every day as the atomic clocks in our GPS satellites that are identical to the atomic clocks here on Earth, they actually tick slower once they're in space above the Earth. Now, Dr. Craig and other neo Lorentzian proponents will claim that both time dilation and length contraction don't actually happen in reality, they merely appear to happen and that motion near the speed of light merely obscures our measurement instruments, despite the fact that we have multiple independent empirical tests that show that both of these phenomena 
actually happen to the best of our observational abilities. In fact, you can see Dr. Craig complain about the verificationist assumptions of scientists who favor the Minkowski four-dimensional space-time interpretation that pr actually predict length contraction and time dilation. I just kind of want to highlight the difference here. The Minkowski interpretation predicts a phenomenon in the theory, and we actually observe that phenomenon in reality, whereas the neo Lorentzian interpretation does not predict this phenomenon and has to come up with some kind of ad hoc explanation as to why it only appears to happen but doesn't actually happen in reality. However, it should be pointed out that we don't just have experimental evidence to disprove what Dr. Craig is saying, we actually have a strong theoretical basis for doing so as well. For that, we can thank the laws of electromagnetism and the great scientist James Clark Maxwell. That's the guy we named Maxwell's equations after. Maxwell's equation showed us two important things that led to Einstein developing special relativity. First, it showed that one of the assumptions of special relativity is true, that C, the speed of light in a vacuum, was a constant. This is because even before we knew that that particular constant was the speed of light, back then it was just a property of electromagnetism that had to be a constant for mathematical consistency in Maxwell's equations. Eventually, Maxwell realized that light was a form of electromagnetic radiation, and we found out that this constant represented what it does. The second thing that Maxwell's equation showed us was that the laws of electromagnetism could only be Lorentz invariant. In fact, it shows that the Galilean invariance required by the Neo-Lorentzian view cannot possibly be applied to electromagnetism. It breaks the equations. This means that if the Neo-Lorentzian view was correct, there'd be a fundamental contradiction in physics between the laws of motion and the laws of electromagnetism. This, combined with all the experimental evidence, and the evidence from the Michelson-Morley experiment, which failed to detect any presence of the luminiferous ether, is the main reason why modern physics rejects the Neo-Lorentzian interpretation and goes with the Minkowski four-dimensional space-time interpretation of Einstein's special relativity. Dr. Craig knows there's no evidence for the Neo-Lorentzian view, and that modern science rejects that interpretation of special relativity. So in response, he turns up his rhetoric about scientism or verificationist assumptions. Now, despite his indignation against people who dare want to verify scientific theories with reality, Dr. Craig sure got very excited when the scientists at CERN might have found particles traveling faster than the speed of light, which would invalidate special and general relativity. He put up an article on his website going on about how Lorentz had been vindicated. Now, unfortunately for Dr. Craig, the scientists at CERN found out that it was a bogus experiment because of a loose fiber optic cable and that general relativity still holds. In a final ditch effort to make the Neo-Lorentzian view seem more appealing, Dr. Craig likes to point to the now empirically established EPR paradox in quantum mechanics that highlights a tension between Bell's theorem and Einstein's relativity. This is an actual problem in modern physics where a direct contradiction between relativity and the laws of quantum mechanics is avoided only by a technicality. Science is actually actively looking for something to truly unify these two well-established theories. Dr. Craig likes to point out that if the neo Lorentzian view was adopted, the EPR paradox would be resolved. The problem for him is that this isn't the only potential solution to the problem, and not all solutions require a privileged reference frame or absolute simultaneity. String theory is currently one of the most promising solutions advocated in science, which, if it was successful, would provide a unified theory of everything in physics, describing everything from the smallest particles to the largest objects in our cosmos and it wouldn't suffer the explanatory deficiencies the neo Lorentzian view has. The reason we don't just accept string theory and its extra seven or more dimensions of space-time is the exact same reason we don't accept the neo Lorentzian view and its privileged reference frame. There's currently no empirical evidence for its existence, and there aren't even any experimental tests to verify that the theory is true. Science requires empirical data to validate a theory because without it, you can always add unfalsifiable conjecture to any theory to get any set of results that you wanted. So why would philosophers like William Lane Craig endorse a theory that, one, is much more complex to explain all of the available data supporting special relativity, two, asserts the existence of an unnecessary and undetectable preferred reference frame, the ether, that we have absolutely no scientific evidence for, 
three accepts that the principle of relativity as well as the Lorentz invariance of the laws of physics is true for every other re reference frame aside from the ether purely by accident and four accept a theory that has less explanatory power than its competing theory well William Lane Craig gives us the answer in his book the tenseless theory of time to quote dr. Craig the tenseless theory is theologically objectionable since its claim that God and the universe coexist tenselessly is incompatible with a robust doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Similarly, in his book Time and the Metaphysics of Relativity, Craig states, We have good reasons for believing that the neo Lorentzian theory is correct, namely, the existence of God in a theoretic time implies it, so that concerns about which version is simpler become of little moment. So, there you have it. We can accept the neo Lorentzian theory of space and time because we believe in the Christian dogma that God exists and that he created the universe without a material cause, out of nothing. And we need this neo Lorentzian theory so the Kalam cosmological argument can be used to supposedly prove the existence of a God that created the universe out of nothing. I hope everybody can see exactly how devastating this information is to the Kalam as an argument for the existence of God. But I want to be clear. This information doesn't disprove the existence of a God. No one can prove a negative. But it does contradict the Christian dogma of God creating the universe out of nothing. In fact, with the tenseless theory of time, space-time existing as a four-dimensional structure, it supports the notion that some form of material reality always existed, which is consistent with modern materialist accounts of the creation of our space-time universe, including the quantum nucleation theory, which I talked about earlier, that only needs quantum energy and the laws of quantum mechanics to have always existed. Now, nothing stops a generic theist from saying that God still had a hand in creation, even if some form of material reality always existed. This just makes God's supposed involvement unnecessary to explain the origin of the universe. And much like with special relativity, you can always layer on unnecessary and unfalsifiable conjecture to any theory to get the result you want. There's just no evidence for doing so. So... That's going to conclude this video series, and I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, there's a lot of technical details involved here, and there was a lot I had to leave out. So if you'd like to see this explanation fleshed out a bit more, I encourage you to visit my blog where I'll have some more detailed information posted. Thanks for watching.